our Heavenly Father, tonight, we thank Thee for the gospel of truth. We thank Thee, Lord, for its power. We thank Thee, Lord, tonight that it brings peace and it brings pardon. And Lord, tonight, as we turn to the sacred page, may we hear, Lord, Thy voice and breathe, Lord, tonight that hush of eternity over our gathering just now. And as we seek tonight to present Christ as the only Savior of sinners, may, Lord, tonight sinners look and live because it's through our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn with me tonight, please, to a well-known portion of the Word of God. We're turning to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. The Acts of the Apostles, 16. And I want you to come down with me, please, to verse number 22. And it's here where we commence our Scripture reading tonight. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. And verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, that's Paul and Silas. And the mag magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them, cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, do you notice that child of God? Others were listening to Paul and Silas in difficult times. They could tell these men were different because in spite of the pain and in spite of the circumstances, they were still able to sing and they were still able to praise and they were still able to pray. And the rest of the prisoners heard them. How do they hear you, child of God? Too many Christians go about moaning. They go about gurning and whinging about this and whinging about that and whinging about the other thing. And there's nothing enticing for the sinner. But I'll tell you this, in the prison cell that night, with their feet in the stocks and their backs lashed open and the blood pouring from their wounds, man, they were able to sing and the prisoners heard them. Do you know something, friends, tonight? There's people that wouldn't even open a Bible. But I'll tell you this, they'll watch you. And they'll watch me. And they'll listen to you. And they'll listen to me to see if there's anything different. Oh, the prisoners heard these pair all right. And they weren't moaning and groaning. They were singing and praising. And I believe that took an effect. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of the sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. For we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to that reading of his own precious truth. There's many wonderful truths tonight in the Word of God. But there's one truth tonight in the Word of God that actually brings us into the heart of God. One truth that brings us into the very heart of God. And not only tonight does this one truth bring us into the heart of God, but this one truth tonight exposes the longing of God. The longing of God that lays deep within the heart of God. Now, what's the longing tonight that's within the heart of God? Well, I'll tell you where that truth is found. You, know, you don't turn to it. I'll do the reading and I'll do the quoting. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Do you know what 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says tonight? Concerning the heart of God, concerning the longing of God, do you know what it says? Who will have all men to be saved and would have them come to the knowledge of the truth? Do you know, my dear unsaved friend tonight, that's the longing in God's heart. That's the longing that lies within the heart of God tonight for all men to be saved. Listen, love. He longs for you to be saved. Listen, sir. If there's anything God longs for you tonight, and that is that you be saved. You see, my dear unsaved friend tonight, God is not willing that any should perish, but that you would come to repentance. And tonight, my dear unsaved friend, this evening, that's one thing tonight God longs for you. Longs for you tonight to be saved. I'll tell you what that truth doesn't say. That truth doesn't say, who will have all men to be baptized? You know, friends, the kingdom of mourn tonight is overflowing with people who are baptized. But they're not saved. And the longing of God's heart tonight is not having all men to be confirmed. I'll tell you, friends, the whole country's coming down with people who are confirmed, but they're not saved. You can be baptized and not saved. You can be confirmed and not saved. I'll tell you another thing, friend, with my truth, this truth doesn't say. This truth doesn't say right, that the will of God is that all men to be religious. You can be as religious as anything and still lost. My friend, tonight, the will of God, tonight, the longing of God that lays within the heart of God, tonight, is that all men be saved. That's all men. That's the scope. That's the scope tonight. All men. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what you've done, tonight, where you're from. All men. You know, friends, this evening, you asked the wonderful message of the gospel. It doesn't matter tonight what you've done. God's not willing that you should perish. God longs for you to be saved. Boy, you think of Saul of Tarsus tonight, the hater of Christians, the one who went about in a soaring rage, putting prisons, putting uh, Christians to prison. 
The very man who held the cloaks that put of them that stoned Stephen to death, even though he was so wicked and so sinful and so cruel, ah, yet it was God's will for him to be saved, and God did save him. And think of the dying thief that day, the scoundrel of society that he was. Yet it was the will, it was the longing of God's heart that he would be saved. Do you know what's lovely about the gospel tonight, dear? It's the longing of God's heart that you be saved. And for you to come to the knowledge of the truth tonight. There's something about the knowledge of the truth tonight that sets men free. The Lord Jesus himself said in John chapter 8 and verse 36 or 37, he said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth tonight that God is love. There's a lot of people tonight in the prison house of loneliness. Do you know, friends, this evening in the kingdom of Morn in the north of Ireland, it would surprise you how many people feel unloved and unwanted. But yet the knowledge of the truth says this evening, God is love. And you think, Lord, you think friends, this evening of other wonderful truths that sets men free. Him that cometh to me, I will in no ways cast out. And I'll tell you, that's a wonderful truth God wants you to come to know. And that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's a mighty truth that God wants you to come to know. And you think of John chapter 10, verse 10, where the Lord Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that's a wonderful truth that can set men free tonight. It's the longing within God's heart tonight that all men be saved. Tonight God wants to speak to us through one man tonight who was wonderfully saved. But here's how he was saved tonight. He was saved the hard way. Some men are so hard. So, me so many men are so headstrong. If God is ever going to save them, God has to save them the hard way. You know, friends, God will never let a sinner go to hell too easily. Sometimes God has to do terrible things to open our ears. God wants to speak to us tonight about one man who had to be saved the hard way. And I hope tonight, love, you don't have to be saved the hard way because God does be cruel at times to be kind. You know, when we come to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16 tonight, we come to a man who's well known as the Philippine jailer. And the first thing we see about this man is the enragement of this man. You know, this man tonight, he was anything but hospitable to the servants of God. You take a look there at verse 24, it says, And who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the prison, into the inner prison, and made their feast, feet fast in the stock. You know, here's a man tonight. He had no time for the servants of God. This man had no time for God. Do you see a man who has no time for God? And a man who has no time for the servants of God, that man has no time for a soul. Wonder is that you tonight? Oh, we're glad to have you at this gospel meeting tonight. But maybe tonight you're like this man this evening. You've no time for God. 
People has tried to talk to you. People has tried to witness to you. But you have no time. No time. And my friend, a man or a woman who has no time for God or no time for the servants of God have no time for their soul. And that's an awful way to be. You know, friend, tonight you have a soul that very soon through death may be taken from the body and ushered out into eternity. And if you're not saved tonight, if God longs you to be saved, you're going to go down into the very torments and fires of hell. So many men like this man tonight, they're that headstrong. They can't see their danger. They can't see tonight how much God really loves them. And here's a man tonight. He was enraged with these men. I would say this man knew all about these men. These men who were going about telling people they need to be saved. He heard about these two fellows going about preaching the gospel. He thrust them into the inner prison and he locked the door and he put them in stocks and locked the door and that was the end of it. Well, that's what he thought. You know, this boy was a tough boy. Real hard man. You know, always tell a hard man when you see one. You know, he's all shoulders and head. He's like a walking hardware shop, hard as nails and thick as a plank. But this man tonight was hard. And this man was tough. Do you know the toughest and the hardest men I've ever come across? Religious people. I remember one twelfth of 12th of July day in Ochnercloy, the assembly field was in the Ochre Road. 1996 it was, and I had this fellow come over to me, and he started getting into a real rage about drum cray and all the rest of it, and what the unionists should do, and what this one should do, and what this and that, and the other thing. And I got the whole rundown of what was going wrong in the country. And I said, Noel, do you know what our wee country needs? It needs Christ. That's what it needs. It needs Christ. Do you see the moment I said that? I never saw a bowler hat disappear as quick. He went into an awful rage. This wee loyal boy. I just walked away. He went into a rage. Why? Because I mentioned to him his need, the country's greatest need is Christ. And he went into a whole rage. The same wee boy that stands up on the 12th of July for God and Oster. There's no time for God half of them. But I'll tell you this, friend, here's a man tonight. He had a cold face. He had a hard heart. He walks into the prison house and he sits down and he puts the feet up and he gives himself a bit of a grunt. He falls off to sleep. It's just like any other night. The enragement of this man. This man who had no time for God. No time for a soul. And he goes to sleep just like any other night. But then tonight there's the encounter of this man. And I'll tell you something now, it was an encounter he wasn't expecting. Because you know what you read there in verse 26? It says there, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed, and the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he threw out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. 
You know, here's a man tonight who had an encounter. Who with? I'll tell you who he had an encounter with. He had an encounter with God. And God had to send an earthquake to bring this man to the census. You know, friends, this evening, God so longs for you to be saved. God so longed for this man to be saved that God had to send an earthquake to awaken him out of his sleep. Tell me, love, what's God going to have to send into your life to bring you to your senses? What's God going to have to do to you, sir, to bring you to your senses, to awaken you out of the slumber and the sleep of death? For me and you, God might have to save you the hard way, sir. It's not the first time God had to send a coffin into the home. There's a fellow who used to come into my past work, and I'll tell you, he was a wild as a hare. And he tells me, or he told me, he says, George, God shoot my world. When Malcolmson swelled my brother up the hallway of our home in a coffin. He says, I thought I was a hard man. And the wheel they wheeled my brother in. I'll tell you, friends, tonight, don't you ever mess with God. Who hath hardened himself against the Almighty and hath prospered? Nobody. And George would tell you it. It was the sight of the coffin coming in. I done it for me. God might have to touch the body, love. Sometimes God has to touch a body to get through to the soul. How many men do I know tonight and they're in heaven? They're in heaven now already. But mind you, God had to touch the body to get them there. I know others, ladies, too, men. No time for God, no thought for God, no thought for their soul on the t until they discovered a wee lump. Boys, they started to think then, all right. And that's why sometimes God has to speak loud. To get us to really listen. told you the story before Sammy Workman had a mission in 1984 outside the village of Rich Hill. My cousin was at that mission. All of you called her and she came home from the mission that night under terrible conviction of sin. And she sat down with her husband Billy and told Billy about her notion about her need to be getting saved. And Billy says, nonsense, Olive, nonsense. You're under these missions and they're brainwashing you. You get saved, all of you. You're out through that door. You'll not be standing under this roof. You and your salvation business. That was 1984. 1991, Billy took a wee cough. He was sitting at his mother's bedside. She was dying. And he took a wee cough and the doctor said to him, Billy, that's like a smoker's cough. I never smoked in my life, doctor. Come in to see me in the morning. Billy went in to see the doctor in the morning. The doctor sent him to hospitals for tests, and the tests come back, cancer in the lung. And shortly before Billy died, he looked at himself in the mirror. And what he saw in the mirror awakened him. He sent for the Reverend Dundas, who was the Church of Ireland minister in St. Saviour's the Dublin there in the Portadown Armagh Road. 
The same man who chased, was going to chase the wife if she ever got saved said to the, said to the, the, the wee minister, Mr. Dundas, I know I haven't long left and I'm not ready. And there and then Billy got saved. But God had to save Billy the hard way. And you see, all of his wife, from that night in 1984 to this night in 2015, she still isn't saved and has no interest in getting saved. That's why God says, my spirit shall not always strive with men. This man's enragement, this man's encounter. You know, God brought this man so low, this man was talking about contemplating suicide. This man had to be saved the hard way. God had to bring him to the very point of despair. Is that the way God's going to have to bring you love? You've heard it week in and week out. But you be careful. You be careful. Because God does terrible things to get us to look up. And God does terrible things to get us to think. Because He longs for you to be saved. This man's, this man's encounter. But look at verse 30 because you've got this man's inquiry. Look at verse number 30. What does it say? It says in verse 29, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do you know, here's a man, like, two minutes before 12, he had no time for God, no thought for God, no thought for a soul. And at two minutes past 12, he's on his knees, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's how suddenly it can happen. That's how quickly God can bring you down. That's how quickly, friends, God can bring you to that hurtful place. He didn't say, sirs, what's happening? He knew what was happening. And through that earthquake, God brought that man under great conviction of his sin. God brought, God brought before him his great need of salvation. So much so, he ran in, called for late, sprang in. He couldn't get in quick enough. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You hear that man's inquiry? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I'll tell you, friend, he wasn't tough now. Sure he wasn't. God turned the tough man into a trembling man. He's trembling now. Oh, he hadn't time for these pair of boys at two minutes to twelve. He has all the time in the world for them now at two minutes past twelve. Has indeed. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man knew what he needed. Do you know what you need? This man suddenly realized he was lost. He was lost. This man realized he was on the road to hell. This man knew he had an encounter with God. Have you? I trust that through this gospel message, you have an encounter with Christ. Because I'll tell you, see, if you don't, you'll never be saved. Every person saved in this church tonight had a personal encounter with Christ. I know I had. And it's personal when Christ comes. Because this man here now didn't give two hoots about anybody else. The only one he gave two hoots about was himself. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to get right with God? Sirs, what must I do? That's his asking. But verse 31, you've got their answer. Believe! On the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Listen, unsaved friend, I'm standing in this pulpit and I'm not making any clear if I was a can. You know how you need to be saved this evening? You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. You need to believe tonight you're a sinner. If you don't believe that, you'll never be saved. But you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinners. That was the plea. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the promise, and thou shalt be saved. Unsaved friend this evening. Believe in the one who went to the cross. Believe in the one who went to Calvary. Believe in the one who suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Suffer the one who suffered the anguish and the agony of the cross. Believe in the one who shed his precious blood. Believe in the one who cried it is finished. Believe in the one who bowed his head and died and tasted death for every man. Friend, don't you believe in any church? Don't you believe in creeds? They're, they're, I tell you, people's going to hell wholesale because they're believing in creeds and believing in catechisms and believing in all their nonsense of the day. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The one who died on the cross, the one who suffered on the cross, the one who bled on the cross, the one who died on the cross, the one who was taken from the cross. Glory to God, he's not on the cross. The one who was buried in the tomb. And on the third day he rose again. And thank God tonight he's a living Savior and tonight he's here in the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he's saying to you, believe on me and thou shalt be saved. You know, I want to finish with this wee last bit. This man's excitement Oh, I love this bit. This man's excitement. Verse 33, And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. He and all his state way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Boys, what a night this was. I'm sure this wife saw some, I'm sure this man's wife saw some difference, you know. Normally every morning he was coming home mumbling and grumbling and groaning. Now he's coming home this night whistling and dancing. Rejoicing in the joy of sins forgiven. That's how I went home that night. 30 years ago. 85. A good year. That's right. I remember that night in the Church of Ireland Church. That night I came to know the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I came to Jesus as I was. As I was. Weary, worn and sad, but I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. And I'll tell you, he had made me glad that night. So glad, I didn't know whether I walked home, floated home, or flew home. Glory to God tonight, there's joy in knowing sins forgiven. There's joy in knowing him. There's joy in knowing there's a home in heaven. One day to be with him. Boys, no wonder this man was rejoicing. I can tell you, friend, you can go home like this man tonight. They don't care why you go home dancing the Highland Jig or not, by sure you've ever had to rejoice about when you're saved. I'll tell you, this man's excitement can be your excitement tonight. But I'll tell you this, this man had to be saved the hard way. God had to break him before he could save him. That's how much, that's how that's how much God longed for that fellow to be saved. And he longs for you to be saved too, sir. And you be careful. Woe to that man that striveth with his maker. God loves you too much to let you go to hell too easily. The earthquake for you might be a sudden death in your family. Terminal illness, maybe. For the purpose to bring you to Christ, whom to know. Is to know life eternal. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. On grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. 
the RA first believed. Jailhouse conversion. Saved. I but saved the hard way. Don't leave it. That the Lord has to talk loud. Let's take a wee moment now in prayer and as we seek his face.